。好，喺呢度咧，再次去歡迎咧，今誒大家今日咧去喺呢個禮拜五嘅晚上咧，都去誒去參與啦，我哋呢一個香港中文大學嘅可持續發展目標論壇系列，係今個年度咧係第二個嘅誒節目嚟嘅。嚇，誒 ，Welcome again to this SDG forum， and today we are going to have two wonderful Uh, very, very, you know, like a, a very, really powerful, you know, uh, speakers to come to uh, speak to us uh, on carbon neutrality. And uh, so today, uh, let me have an introduction first to today's uh, program. So I believe a lot of us understand that um, now as greenhouse gas levels are really rapidly rising. Uh, the Earth's climate is really rapidly changing. As you can witness last year, there are tremendous amount of wildfires and different sorts of climatic disasters across all of the world. Floods somewhere and then uh, rainstorms elsewhere and then drought in and other places and fires elsewhere. So you can really see climate is rapidly changing. But the good news is the world has also been increasing Uh, having seen seeing increasing momentum towards carbon neutrality, more and more countries are on board on this bandwagon of trying to reduce their carbon emission and arriving at carbon neutrality. Especially after COP26, uh, which is the global climate uh, sort of conference, or uh, where global leaders have come together, agreeing on some pathways towards carbon neutrality for the next century. So the stake is really high. A trillion of investment are expected to be spent on uh, net zero emission technology and practices and jobs, money, industries, economies, geopolitics are all expected to shift dramatically with winners and losers in different places. So today we'll have two speakers, Dr. William Yu and also Professor Xu Yuan um, to come to talk to us about carbon neutrality from both the perspective of uh, science and policy. So may I introduce, well, a uh, speaker, um, Professor Xu Yuan, uh, or uh, may I introduce the first speaker first? Uh, Dr. William Yu uh, is the first speaker. He is the founder and chief executive officer of World Green Organization. And Dr. Yu is an energy economist and climate professional by training. Uh, he completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge. He also earned an executive MBA degree from the Thunderbird uh, School of Global Management at Arizona State University in the US. Additionally, Dr. Yu has gained valuable regional management experience by working at uh, US multinationals, uh, as well as financial institutions. And Dr. Yu is currently the adjunct professor as well at the City University of Hong Kong and also Director of Studies of the University of Wales, uh, Trinity St. David, holding a research co-partner position with the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering of the University of Hong Kong as well. And he's, he has published uh, in, a, in a lot of international journals, including public policy, uh, energy, poverty, indoor built environment, so on and so forth. And at the same time, Dr. Yu has been serving in uh, ma serving many public posts, uh, both internationally and locally. Uh, for instance, task force at the United Nations, as well as different agencies uh, in the local Hong Kong government. And he has also very frequently appearing on uh, mass, media, uh, mass media as well. So probably uh, uh, some of you might have already seen uh, Dr. Yu in uh, various places, maybe on TV or uh, radio and so on and so forth. And he is going to talk to us about the latest climatic disasters and the corresponding risk reduction strategies. Uh, he will also look into the technological innovation for carbon neutrality uh, today. The second speaker is Professor uh, Xu Yuan, uh, well, or we should say, uh, or Yuan Xu. Um, will, he will explore the massive opportunities uh, and challenges of achieving carbon neutrality in a variety of economic sectors. So Professor Xu is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Resource Management. He leads the environmental policy and governance program in the Institute of uh, Environment, Energy and Sustainability here at CUHK. He has published very widely on a number of energy and environmental policies and strategies, especially on the enforcement, compliance, as well as related technological innovation in industry development, uh, covering fossil fuels, renewables, 
And before joining CHK, Professor Xu uh, received a PhD degree in public policy from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at uh, Princeton University. And also uh, he was a postdoctoral research associate uh, at MIT. He also holds an MS degree in climatology. So uh, Dr. Xu, uh, Xu, uh, Professor Xu uh, have both a scientific and a policy background as well. And he is going to uh, speak to us today mostly on uh, the opportunity and challenges of uh, carbon neutrality in a variety of economic sectors. All right. So uh, I guess with no further ado, oh, and I am Professor Amos Tai uh, of Earth System Science Program and also uh, Associate Director of General Ed University General Education here at CUHK. And I am a climatologist or climate scientist by training. And uh, so kind of also understanding a little bit about you know, uh, the issues of climate change. Uh, but today, the two speakers are much more experienced in terms of the policy making. So I'm very glad to be here uh, to be learning from both of them uh, today as well. So with no further ado, may I pass the time to Dr. William Yu uh, to speak to us. Uh, first of all, for today, since it's a, a SDG forum, I, I will uh, talk about uh, some kind of progress related to SDG, especially uh, the goals number 13 uh, on climate action. Um, just a, a, a very brief snap, snapshot about uh, our current situations, what's going on. So uh, to start with, um, much related to climate action, uh, number 13, uh, disaster, climate disaster, how to prevent climate disaster, how to build our resilience, how to carry out education, as well as um, setting up policy, to build adaptation measures, all are related. So um, to talk about climate change, especially climate action, I, I uh, this time I I have chosen to start with you know a uh, 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 disaster perspective. So um, you you will see lots of lots of uh, related news and incidents happening uh, in around the world. Okay, so. Um, you you may uh, see all these heat wave floodings you know everywhere. So night uh, say for example um, I have chosen uh, six uh, classical case I would say unfortunately very unfortunate uh, incidents. So um, say for example the one in Canada ninety percent of the village of that area burned. Extreme uh, rainfall. Uh, the next one, extreme rainfall causing the flooding. Uh, 90 people um, die in uh, another one. 90 people die in typhoon. But how about cold waves? 200 people die. Um, so is it enough? No. Look at the floods in Europe. Over 240 killed in a serious rainfall. But I, I believe that might be affected by some kind of uh, landslides or other damages made to the buildings. And not to mention the hurricanes, you know, every time the big hurricanes, you know, spread around, you know, uh, spread across the US. So heat waves, wildfire, cold waves, floods, hurricanes, I, I think it's good enough, right, to bring not only inconvenience, I would say it's a disastrous damages to our daily life. Um, so look at the figures. I, I would like to draw your attention. Um, I have uh, chosen the mega size disaster for a reference. So you can see the frequency happening in 2021. We got five cases in that year already. Okay, so um, last year, okay. Uh, in total, around 1,000 people die. Um, and hundred billions of dollars of damages. So I, I just want you to feel about the frequency. You might not read the newspaper every day, okay? Even you read the newspaper, but some of the local disaster might not be covered by a Hong Kong newspaper. So you, you can imagine the frequency and also, you know, the, the scale of all this disaster happening around. You, you may, I, I don't want to fall into argument. You may argue, well, you need to make a clear uh, classification. It uh, belongs to disaster, typhoon, 
uh, super typhoon and then extreme weather and wet and also the academic so the correlation between what uh, extreme incident and climate change you know climate change says have a background but no proven link with a uh, super typhoon blah 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 but more or less I, I think what we can see is all these are happening what should we do why climate action 13 put more emphasis on disaster preparedness and prevention okay um oops uh so you you might say oh it's a bit a bit far away a bit remote because developed the country emits all this co2 for many many centuries but now it is the developing countries which bear the impact brought by climate change uh, this top four or five most in the south african africa uh, areas you know red color represents the uh, a higher number of people affected by climate disaster uh, followed by the orange color and yellow color in terms of the severity okay so you you will see you know uh we we don't feel we we don't feel the direct impact as a as we live in a, a very developed city but actually use some imagination we don't we haven't been i i haven't been to donga okay you heard about the name malawi if you are a soccer lover maybe you heard about the name okay but nepal then um, we 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 might be more familiar okay in comparison so that's the 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 part we 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 can feel what happened and what kind of impact they are facing uh so i PCC report uh, released, uh, I would say, uh, kind of recently, more recently, and uh, to stay, we we need to to uh, uh, to try our best effort to you know prevent the temperature rise beyond one point five degrees Celsius. Uh, also followed by the COP twenty six. Um, what we got the message is our emissions continue record breaking. I mean, before the pandemic, uh, always a rec record-breaking uh, high emission achieved. And then uh, now, uh, although a little bit improvement, but we in long run uh, as climate rule, as we talk about a 20 years, 30 years span, the trend is continue to rise in CO2, continue to rise in temperature, and continue uh, you know, to rise in our PPM past per million uh, over 400. So not to mention those already emitted staying in the atmosphere. What can we do with our greenhouse gas? I, I think that's the, the basic question we, we want to ask again. So uh, in, in the UN perspective, um, different kinds of risk management, especially in line with climate action uh, climate 13 I, I will talk about in next two slide about the climate change one um we they they try to set up the 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 mechanism um to encourage to engage countries to take action so as you can see uh the left hand side the diagram start from the very left hand side now is data do we have risk data can we evaluate the impact do do we know the, the weather change, uh, the frequency of those uh, disaster and incidents? Uh, what can we establish to educate people, to engage the local community, uh, to build resilience, all this? And how can we monitor the progress and reporting? And also, more importantly, the knowledge we build, you know, to face all, to face all this disaster so I, I i i want to engage you in a contest about facing natural disaster you know very extreme incidents not not in hong kong you remember hong kong we have a very 
low pain picture, a uh, freezing weather one day, and and our firemen they don't have the suitable uh wear the shoes, you know, to to enter the areas, you know, to do some rescue work. So I I would say is uh, we we are really not familiar with the adaptation measures when we face the this kind of risk you know, uh, kind of disaster in Hong Kong. Um, we, we are quite well protected. So I, I think on uh, the UN perspective, they put more emphasis on the capacity building, the policy building in order, you know, to, to cope with all these uh, coming challenges. Okay, so uh, today we, we talk about uh, climate action goal number 13. Um, what, what is it about? They have some sub-target. Uh, if you cannot see, I, I read it out for you, like uh, some sub-target, like strengthen resilience and adaptation capacity to climate-related disasters. So that's why I, I start with disaster. I uh, uh, oh, the, the topic, we might not be, uh, we, we feel very remote as a Hong Kongist. And also uh, another target is in integrate climate change measures into policy and planning, you know, more from the governmental, from the uh, UN perspective and build knowledge and capacity to meet climate change. So we need to engage different people. Okay, uh, I always use th this example. Say now we have an earthquake happening in Hong Kong, uh, it, it, it student, okay, uh, what will you do? You hide under a table, you run out and uh, pop down to the street, or you uh, or you uh, go to somewhere else. No, because we are not Japanese. Okay, a uh, Japanese. If you ask them a uh, a uh, a few years old uh, child, uh, child, definitely he or she will answer, hide under the table to get some protection. You know to make sure your your head will not hit by any fallen objects, okay, to save your own life or to wait for rescue. Um, why make this difference? Is the norm, the knowledge, you know, all this uh, kind of capacity building required to face the future climatic disaster? Then the first answer you should ask, what are those disasters? Uh, what do they look like? Okay, so I, I think that's the area I'm trying to set the scene for you, why we need all this framework to build, you know, to cope with climate change. So uh, a lot of stuff uh, here in this diagram, okay, I, I just copied from the COP, uh, some from the SDG report. Um, so uh, like, like this area, um, Fortunately, we have a, 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 a quiet time or, or very unfortunate, maybe the lockdown, you know, in 2019, we experienced a 9% drop in uh, the greenhouse gas, but then it rebound in 2020 already. Okay, um, you, you, you might feel, oh, we, we don't have much activities. We all stay home. But, you know, the, the supermarket is still operating, uh, you know, the the courier still operating, you know, the, the truck, the delivery truck still operating, all this still creating certain level of greenhouse gas. So um, the challenge just us are, are still there. We, we really need to you know, take action uh, to, to, to do all this. Okay, so, um, there are some uh, kind of um, uh, details, uh, but I, I, I won't go into very details, but um, first is we, we need to uh, change our economic system, uh, a, a really a paradigm shift, you know, to change our, you know, um, economic model. Otherwise our emissions will continue to increase. Um, our energy source, especially. And then uh, for a uh, global pandemic, maybe it's a, an alarm, but also 
uh, apart from ringing the bell, I guess uh, the adaptation measures. No, we, we have to face some kind of disaster, unavoidable. Um, then we need to maybe to build up the flood defenses. Many years ago, uh, I've been mean more than five, six years ago, we we trying to do some kind of similar to modeling and to point out, um, you know, there could be a flooding if we uh, face the super typhoon again, um, our harbor tunnel will be flat. So um, we, we need to know the extent, the level of impact. Um, relying on scientific research, relying on computer modeling, relying on you know different types of weather forecasts, we need to build up a, a, a scenario how to face the future challenges. And then what should we do? So in as uh, like mentioning here is the, the drought resistant crops, you know, uh, uneven distribution of rainfall, you know, extreme weather death will definitely, you know, affect the crop productivity. And also, you know, the flooding, the, the duration continues, that really affect, you know, all this kind of uh, crop productivity, the species. So they need to switch to the other uh, types of uh, crops, you know. So um, all this is far away from uh, city uh, people like us, but um, that's what happening in in the other parts of the world. So we need uh, to speed up our transition and also the financial uh, support will change the entire picture. Um, so what they really care about in, in terms of, uh, from the UN perspective is how many people will die during the disaster from direct impact or indirect impact. Okay, so um, unlike the infrastructure we have in this city, well protected, but I, 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 I remember many years ago, I, I gave another uh, talk at a Chinese university uh, with another uh, overseas scholar together. Um, I, uh, I, I, I mentioned about, you know, uh, we, we, uh, I met, I used the uh, Hurricane Sandy as an example. They use six million US dollar to revamp the MTR station. You know, it's flooded uh, with uh, thousands of different types of materials. You know, damages, and the blackout happening around. You know, the city, all this, and all the car park will fully flood. And you can see, even there we have a, a fatality incidents happening in the basement of those car park. You know, we even for the uh, their MTL. Okay, so I I would say um, we don't expect this kind of very extreme scenario when we build the MTL, when we build our car park, our structure is not designed in that way. So now we should have this kind of uh, conscious. So recently, uh, the UN Secretary uh, has uh, proposed six climate positive action. Once you see all this action, what does that mean? That means we are lacking of those you know, a uh, kind of uh, effort and solution. So again, it's about money. Only all this money flowing into the projects that can make a contribution to elevate climate impact. Those money can flow into the projects can help adaptation. And as and also the green jobs create because of the elimination of the traditional fossil fuel that creates a job opportunity. And this kind of paradigm shift to a green economy with sustainable solution, that's very important. So in, in the green finance context, what we, uh, we uh, argue nowadays is we don't give the price 
we don't price the externalities. We don't price the climate sustainability risk in our financial system. So that's why we still enjoy the subsidies for fossil fuel. We still don't need to pay for the pollutions, you know, result from all these non-sustainable uh, and time with climate impact of projects. So I, I think um, that's the area we need to uh, work on. And I am also engaged in green finance and green technology in these few years. I, I, I think that is the direction to speed up the entire, you know, changes. So if uh, for the national uh, determined, you know, a kind of self contribution, we are still far, far away. If you ask the progress is, um, we are, we will achieve, you, you follow the, 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 the commitment in terms of the level of carbon reduction, definitely we will face three degrees Celsius instead of to keep the temperature rise, you know, uh, by 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's very uh, challenging, far, far, far away. So we need to do more uh, for the developing countries. They ask for money. If you don't have money, how can I rebuild the infrastructure? How can I convert my technology? You know, I don't have the sufficient uh, low carbon energy source, how to generate uh, energy. Uh, to this morning, I uh, talked, uh, I received a, a interview, a radio interview invitation uh, by uh, RTHK3, uh, put in the back chat about the nuclear fusion because uh, there was a news announced yesterday uh, from the UK. Oh, that energy can create 30 times, okay? More energy, okay? Um, uh, much uh, like a sun, you know, much more powerful uh, than, than the fossil fuel, than the coal fire generation. I don't know, uh, we have to wait. Uh, it, because uh, it hasn't been scaled up, it hasn't been commercialized. Uh, but um, we really need a very big kind of revolution in our energy supply, the demand side, both demand side and supply side management. So you, you will see the Paris Agreement on touching on different aspects, you know, on the damage, on the adaptation, and also on the finance side on the energy, on the, uh, the change, the clean, clean tech, as well as, you know, um, but you, you know, uh, we are talking about, we need to cut our emission by half. <laughs> our, our, uh, our, and also our energy continue to increase by 50%, you know, in the coming years. So, so it, that's, that sounds very challenging. So, um, well, uh, as I mentioned, the disaster reduction, um, they, they set different KPI parameters to measure you know, the number of deaths that we, uh, result from all this disaster, the economic loss. At least I think uh, after the COP26 uh, COP is a good start to quantify all this in terms of monetary value, in terms of GDP, okay? The, the financial loss. Um, although we they, they don't mention much about you know uh, the other kinds of uh, uh, monetary estimation, but at least I, I think we we start to link the financial part that will speed up everything. Um, so the. The priority is understand the disaster risk. Uh, we continue to strengthen our risk governance and also how to uh, prepare ourselves to face all this disaster. And also um, our investments should be in place. Otherwise we keep talking. No money, no technology. I, I would say PPT policy, okay, to set the standard to set the level of effort and reduction. Technology, okay, very important to make a big changes and our determination. And also, you know, um, that that is very 
very important. Um, you will see the um, the adaptation, the strategy in line with this, uh, the greener, the better. So some countries even don't have the related policy or they are not ready to prepare. They haven't started for some countries. And so uh, for climate change, uh, UN has developed a, a climate change performance index. Okay, so that index uh, consists of like 10 or 15 parameters but mainly classified into four categories, renewable energy, energy, and um, also the policy, whether they are, are available, laying down the roadmap for carbon reduction. So the higher the score, as you can see, the better. That means they have policy, you know, they have commitment for a higher percentage of renewable energy, all this. So um, you will see Denmark, uh, Luxembourg, the uh, uh, Netherlands have done a better job, uh, Morocco, okay. Uh, some are not very ready. And you can see, uh, so for, to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius, how can we halve our emissions? And you will see, uh, some uh, red color means uh, they are the rating they are not very ready to make a contribution to combat climate change uh, yellow and orange uh, may be in the middle okay uh, some green color they have done a, a, a better job so so um <laughs> I always believe the money can make a big changes, uh, a big change. So uh, the money can drive, you know, the, the capital flow can can drive the changes. So, um, but you will see uh, the more emission, uh, the, especially the industrialized nations, which country, they don't make the proportional contribution in terms of the money to the climate fund. So that's always, uh, Apart from the pandemic that delays our development gain, another issue is money. And adaptation, again, that also um, mostly based on the infrastructure that requires billions, billions of dollars to get uh, the dollars to get it done. Uh, as I mentioned in the earliest line, flooding, hurricane, you know, all this. Even I, I, you used to ask in Hong Kong, if we foot, uh, face super typhoon again, 180 miles uh, kind of, you know, impact. So um, our grid, can we stand? Um, you know, all these infrastructure, are they ready, you know, to face these kind of challenges? So uh, business, um, again, they, they maybe care about more care about whether there is a carbon tax, whether that will increase their operational costs, uh, whether their employee will be in a, 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 a health a kind of high with higher health risk, like a history in some areas, whether the commodity price will become more volatile due to the weather change. You know, the feedstock, the crops, produce supply, jobs and then that will increase the the cattle price and then the leather price all this raw material so they, there is a chain effect and so we we need the uh, many kind of revolutions uh, kind of change in in the entire supply chain um so that's uh maybe i i can skip all this but you will see the from the risk perspective and uh, you know, different types of impacts to people, to uh, the agricultural aspect, uh, to you know other types of disaster, to children, you know, to buildings, to people, to software, uh, your know, hardware and software. So um, that's the the challenges. So when going back, uh, almost finished, okay, um, going back to the city perspective, um, recently, uh, uh, is it Netherlands, 
uh, pick up the donut uh, donut model. Okay, they they try to put it apply it uh, in the city level uh, to combat climate change. So the the most inner ring uh, we talk about the some necessities, basic life supplies, water. We need water. We need food. You know that relates to co uh, crop productivity. We need you know all this, and the outside is. Uh, because of the human induced impact, you know, uh, causing you know uh, different types of impact on ocean, on the air, and uh, on the air quality, on uh, our ozone layer, you know, all this. Some are interrelated. Uh, so they they trying to work out the relationship, the interrelationship between all these aspects, and how we can implement some kind of policy and work you know to to stop uh, to min i would say mitigate all this impact okay uh, a few final slides about carbon neutrality uh, some people ask me a difficult question what is the difference between net zero and carbon neutrality i i think um, maybe scope free whether you uh, can cover you know the supply chain relate to paper use relate to the flight emissions, all these uh, net zero that you you need to uh, cover the, the scope free as well. Um, so how we can uh, do the carbon removal? You know, um, the M the atmosphere uh, we the the CO two we emit to atmosphere. Um, we we cannot avoid using electricity. We cannot avoid you know uh, generating the carbon. Although we can minimize the 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 level, but um, how we can make good use of other means of in terms of technology, behavioral change, lifestyle, you know, to remove the same amount of carbon we generate. I, I think that's the, the issue we start to face when talking about carbon neutrality. And um, planting trees, uh, as you can see, a uh, 10 action mentioned by UN, planting trees is is one, but uh, we we have many different types of option. And another one is um, uh, Hong Kong. I, I think talk much less about this is from the chem chemistry. Material science is one, one area, but chemistry, especially they, they learn about how to bomb all this CO2 because uh, the traditional carbon capture and storage, very expensive. Okay, we cannot just rely on bumping all this CO2 uh, generate from the fossil fuel in down to the uh, oil fuel, right? Uh, to, to store it, very expensive. But more or less now they are looking for like uh, to put it inside the product and it's a, a embedded carbon uh, that will not cause a much leakage. That should be the, the direction they call CCUS, uh, carbon capture, usage or utilization and storage. That's the area. Now talking about like cement, you know, they 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 bomb the CO2 in, inside the cement. The advantage is not only storing the CO2, but you know to speed up the the drying process for the cement from 20 more days to three days. Something like this kind of technology. The NAMI technology maybe. Um, Final slide. So, uh, different companies are working on this, uh, all this area. Um, we heard a lot nowadays. Hydrogen, you know, uh, you know all these uh, electrolysis, many uh, biomass, all this. But um, still, uh, some are already available in the industrialized application. But some, I would say, uh, still we need a uh, commercialization. We need, uh, it's always, you know, for new tech, I, I have start to work with some startup. It's good in the labs, okay? It was in the uh, lab scale, but when you trying to do it uh, in a mass production, it's a different story. So uh, I would say uh, there are many other considerations, the accessory and entire infrastructure uh, set up. Just say, for example, in the future for transport, if you shift to uh, hydrogen, 
safety, uh, apart from the safety measures, how about, uh, you know, all these refill or charging station set up all this. So it's not merely about the technology itself, but also about the entire infrastructure policy. And just like in the earlier days, renewable energy just start, you know, the grid issue, the allocation issue, is is always a, a policy to a, a, a kind of competition so yeah still a long road to go but i i don't think i have time to to cover all this uh, video maybe i stop here yeah thank you very much thank you very much dr william yu for your very insightful comments and opinions and experience sharing really of the uh, challenges uh the backdrop and the challenges faced by uh, societies in terms of mitigating climate change and the challenges related to achieving carbon neutrality um well we will put i i already see questions uh for dr yu already and uh but we'll like to we'd like to put all of the question and answers and uh discussion uh to the very end so uh collectively both speakers can then answer or address a variety of questions from uh, the audience so now uh, may i invite um professor xu for to uh carry on Sure. Thank you very much, uh, MSS. It's, it's my great honor to be here um, and share my screen. Um, now I do it full screen. It works, right? So good. So I, I'll talk about carbon neutrality and, um, and all kinds of opportunities and challenges we're going to face. Uh, basically, it's the uh, next 30, 40 years. We'll see a very different world from today. I'll start with this. Um, so it's, I'm sure that if you, if you read any news today, in the past week, basically, you cannot miss this. Uh, what's going on in Ukraine? So in, in the Ukraine crisis, there's actually a very big element about infrastructure. It's one specific pipeline called Nord Stream 2. If you can, if you can see my mouth, uh, you can see um, this, uh, Nord Stream 2. And that's actually already a Nord Stream 1, so passing through from, 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 from Russia directly to Germany. So actually, so what's going on here is with, with, uh, with another pipeline, so passing through Ukraine, reaching Germany. So currently, this uh, Nord Stream Two is making a big uh, is making a big impact. It's actually, one of the one of the central pieces in this Ukraine crisis. So Russia tries to bypass Ukraine and directly reach Europe through this Nord Stream Two. And and um, so today, I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, story. It's a very, it's very interesting and a very complicated story. But I'm saying that infrastructure is so important um, for for geopolitics and also for daily life for the economy. We Without this, for example, in Europe, if uh, because for example, in Germany, they're they trying to uh, reach a carbon neutrality. They're at the same time they're closing down their nuclear power stations, and they're also using quite a lot of coal. Uh, and and their coal is actually soft coal. It's, uh, it's actually low quality coal. It's very different uh, from those um, anthracite or uh, bituminous coals, like hard coal. So, anyway, so if they want to achieve carbon neutrality and uh, uh, natural gas becomes very important fuel for them, especially in the next few next few decades. So nowadays uh, they're facing this uh, big thing. So whether they should, they want to act, they want to Russian gas, but it seems that it's, it's a lot of things going into play. And so, so infrastructure has played very major roles in the uh, in, in the development of different economies and uh, and for us, for us to understand to local um, geopolitics. Now I'll talk about a few things. So first one is um, as uh, Dr. Yu also mentioned about carbon neutrality, the different uh, um, treaties. So basically, for carbon neutrality, we have gone a long way in the past few decades. Um, so the first one started in 1992 uh, in Rio, um, Brazil. So with the Earth Summit in 1992, and so they started with the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Then in 1997, um, so, it, so basically these different parties, they come together to negotiate into a treaty to mitigate emissions for the first time. So as in 1997, that was seems to be a successful, happy moment. But later, it's to prove that uh, Kyoto Protocol, a lot of flaws, and the United States was um, not very interested in ratifying it. So and so, it's, so, it's, so then it got in 2015. Um, so it's, so the entire world got another uh, another quite big mobilization, and we started talk about another treaty that's called Paris Agreement as uh, the most important treaty after Kyoto Protocol to to regulate global emissions. 
but then within this uh, this framework of Paris, Paris agreements, because uh, uh, for for the Paris agreements, every country must uh, update their commitments every five years. So this was the reason why um, in 2020, seen a lot of countries uh, committed to carbon neutrality. So then, so, so this was uh, the missions in 2019, and uh, so it's, you can see all the major parties that there, especially China's case. China now accounts for about 28, 29% uh, of global carbon dioxide emissions from energy consumption. So China's emissions, for example, is already uh, bigger than Europe um, plus United States. It's, uh, it's almost equivalent to the entire developed countries putting together. So that's a very big thing. So to, and, uh, and all of these countries basically have committed to carbon neutrality for different years. But China's commitment was, was for 20, 2060, European Union, uh, United States, Japan, is for 2050, uh, India for 2070. So anyway, when these uh, countries committed for carbon neutrality, actually, so when they made the commitment, um, I'm sure that they have done their calculations. And I'm sure that they also understand uh, what kind of stake uh, they are facing. It's not very easy, for example, to do this because um, it's, it's going to decide um, their country's major economic development, major energy transition in the next three decades. So we'll, we'll show you a little bit about uh, these different changes uh, in the next uh, three, de three decades. So if they really achieve carbon neutrality, individual countries um, try to achieve carbon neutrality, or if the entire world is trying to achieve carbon neutrality, what kind of changes we can see and uh, what kind of impacts uh, we, may, we, may, we may have. So I'll, I'll pick up a um, two different sectors, mainly about transport sector, or specific talk more about liquid fuels. Another one I'll talk about electricity. So these two sectors are a little bit different. They're connected, but uh, they also have um, a lot of differences. So it's, uh, I'll start with this story. Uh, for example, if you drive, if you drive car, passenger cars, for example, so in Hong Kong, basically we have uh, only, um, so basically these days we choose, for if you drive uh, uh, oil-based cars, basically gasoline, so diesel cars mainly, well, diesel is mainly used for trucks and big buses because they provide you with more power, you need the power to do this. But a few years ago, for example, there was a big scandal um, about diesel passenger cars, not trucks, um, especially about, uh, about Volkswagen at that time, about uh, 2014, 2015. There was a big scandal there at that time. So it's because in Europe, uh, quite a lot of cars uh, in Europe at that time were diesel cars because they care about climate change and diesel cars give you a high efficiency, but at the same time, it gives you more air pollutant emissions. So at that time, this, uh, this, this companies, they claimed that uh, could solve, um, they could solve the air pollution problems, at the same time also have more efficiency and also have, have lower CO2 emissions. But of course, you know, to lay down so that becomes a scandal, um, it was not true. So they cannot have, they cannot tackle both um, perfectly at the same time. So, anyway, so this is the reason why diesel cars have been diminishing rapidly in the past years. And uh, so it's basically, it's, um, basically, for example, so these uh, major countries, um, so they're still using uh, gasoline vehicles and quite, quite a lot of them actually have uh, claimed that uh, they're going to phase out this kind of uh, oil-based vehicles entirely. So this, this, uh, this uh, competition between diesel and gasoline country, this war has been won by the gasoline. Okay, so it's uh, diesel cars basically uh, failed the battle. There's another battle ongoing. Um, so if you see that case, it's, uh, it's a different two different technologies. And this battle is also with two different technologies. It's one is oil-based vehicles, the other one is uh, electric vehicles. For example, you see that so more and more so that in the, uh, so, so it's, we are using electric vehicles. For example, it's uh, quite a lot of people, what well, increasing number of people in Hong Kong now are driving um, Tesla, or all kinds of uh, uh, electric vehicles. But if you look at these uh, cases, for example, General, General Motors, or most of the current large um, auto, auto companies, for example, General Motors or Toyota, or Volkswagen, for example, even though that they sell so many more vehicles than Tesla, but Tesla's stock market uh, value is so much higher than, than those, uh, those auto companies. And if you see that, what's the reason there? It's mainly because um, uh, they see the future. It's not the present. Um, you see that the, the future uh, more and more so belongs to electric vehicles. So if, if that's the case, if then you see that uh, uh, in different places, um, now there's a lot more, a lot, so it's a, the, the market share of electric vehicles is increasing very rapidly. Um, so, so that will actually have a direct competition. It's going to eat the share of uh, oil-based um, vehicles. 
So that's going to have huge impacts on this auto com auto market. So, for example, those uh, if if those companies, um, if, even though they're a century old uh, companies, they're very mature, very successful in the past. But if they cannot catch up uh, with uh, the current revolution, they'll be left they'll be left out. And so, in the case, for example, uh, so they can go bankrupt. You see that. Um, so, so in, next, in the next decade or two, uh, we will not be surprised to see that these uh, very old brands, very large companies, um, can disappear uh, from the market. And new companies like Tesla, like Viadi, so these companies can catch up and uh, really can become a dominant um, players in the auto market. So that's uh, that's something we're going to see, and uh, that's also because because of the carbon neutrality concerns. So then, so electric vehicles, then I want to talk about electricity after we de decarbonize electricity and electric vehicles provide a very important pathways um, to, to really reduce our emissions and further decarbonize it. Eventually we're going to, we, we can achieve um, net zero emissions of carbon. For example, this one is, for example, when we talk, if we, if we don't use oil, if uh, oil-based vehicles are going to be phased out and if oil is phased out, for example, these companies. So currently, for example, this is uh, Saudi Ramco. Saudi Ramco is the largest oil, is our largest oil market oil company in the entire world. It is uh, it's worth it's worth uh, two trillion US dollars. Or BP or Shell, for example, is, so they have their troubles. So so the current thing is, uh, for example, BP has uh, long been trying to try to advertise advertise that actually they're not British Petroleum. They're actually they're beyond Petroleum. Because if they cannot adapt to this new change, especially on the on the on the carbon neutrality, we're going to see that this kind of trend would will accelerate. So the thing is, can they adapt? So this in this year, in this few months, they're making a lot of money. They're making a um, uh, very uh, very very high profit margin, but uh, because uh, the oil price is getting up. But in the long run. In the long run, so, so what kind of things could be there, and also that can affect the investment. So, recently, for example, if they decide a future investment, what kind of whether they should dig a well, whether they should spend money, more money to develop new oil resources, they have to really think twice, because the money uh, may not. So, it's, even though that make they may be making money uh, today, uh, but in the future, if they make a lot of investment, and this investment could be stranded assets, so they will be useless in the future. Or to be very much underutilized, so they have to really think that whether they should make investment in that direction or not. And also, if they, if if uh, if everybody's moving forward, for example, in 2050, if the entire world is close is close to carbon neutrality, um, and our oil consumption is expected to fall sharply, do they have the future? In 2050, do they have to be there? So that's a very big question facing all of these companies. Uh, if they don't think about this uh, this this trouble today, and uh, very likely they will be in trouble um, in the next year, next uh, in the next few decades. Not only, for example, if you think about Hong Kong's case, this is our tongue gas. Think about the fuel that we use um, in our kitchen. So, so actually, for example, Hong Kong's tongue gas is produced is produced through um, uh, natural gas and uh, and NAFTA. For example, this uh, one is uh, oil based, the other one is natural gas. So yes, in the future, so they, are, they also have to think about it. Um, so in, if Hong Kong, Hong Kong has already announced to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. So in 2050, if that's the case, and tongue gas must, uh, have, must change dramatically, tongue gas will be very different from today. If they are still the same company as today, uh, so that Hong Kong cannot achieve carbon neutrality. And, uh, and of course, if Hong Kong wants to achieve carbon neutrality, then they may have to, uh, think something about uh, about tongue gas. Whether tongue gas, um, there's a role there for them to play, or they should be out. So that's a very important thing there, as well. Uh, and not only, for example, if you think about shipping, so that's uh, that's uh, that's a road transport. And if you think about shipping, shipping the shipping is a lot more complicated than road transport because of scale. Uh, for road transport, you can use um, electric vehicles, and those kind of technologies um, are good enough to to replace a lot of oil-based vehicles. But shipping is a lot harder. Um, so for batteries, it's very difficult to have uh, some cross-Pacific journey. Um, this kind of thing will be difficult. So it's so how you're going to achieve this. So that's the thing, for example. So how we can use um, these fuels um, to 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 drive these uh, large uh, ships. And also aviation. Aviation is also very different. Aviation, so, so countries use aviation. Kerosene is, oil, is also oil-based, 
So that's uh, something that, for example, we need some um, high density, high de high density of uh, of energy um, to to drive um, this uh, this airplanes. And so it's so it's, if we we can batteries to do to do this, just not possible. And so that's the thing that also we have also face quite a lot of challenges to achieve carbon neutrality. So and so another one when when we out is to use biofuel for these, especially for these. Uh, uh, very difficult to replace uh, for these uh, things, shipping and uh, and aviation, for example, if they are very difficult to get replaced by by electric electricity. So we can use biofuel. But biodiesel, for example, this biodiesel, this one is Borneo. Uh, if you go, to, if you go, to, if you travel to Borneo, um, for example, Kalimantan, Indonesia, and uh, and also Malaysia, uh, the eastern part of Malaysia, for example, so you see this kind of palm trees. They produce by biodiesel, and this is uh, uh, this is corn from uh, the United States, and it produced by ethanol there. You can use bio, you can you, you can use this uh, biofuel to drive um, um, the ships, and also your 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 airplanes. But of course, then there's a there's a problem there. If uh, if they reach a very large scale, and we have to compete uh, with food, with food production. So that's another thing that we have to really think carefully, and uh, so it's in order to avoid um, or limit the competition between fuel and food. So another one, for example, so about oil, then it's just another story about this one. If you if you if you are interested in a global global financial system, and so this one is a so the current um, global financial system was uh, established in 1944 uh, in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. So that was uh, the end of uh, World War II. These countries um, they had good expectation that the war is going to be over very soon. So then, it's basically in 1944, they established the Bretton Woods system that is based on that is based on U.S. dollars. Basically, U.S. dollars becomes uh, uh, the dominant currency um, since then. So, you know, so that was uh, the, that was used the gold standard. Basically, the United States had a lot of gold uh, reserve. So then, so it's a guarantee that if you have gold, you have U.S. dollars, and you can change it to to gold and in a time at a fixed exchange rate. But then this one was um, not sustainable later on, so especially one of the reasons because the United States spent so much money uh, in Vietnam. Um, so, you know, so the U.S. basically got bankrupt a um, little bit at that time. So then they have to abandon um, their gold standard, standard. So there was a Nixon shock in August 1971. So then that, uh, that, that really sent a lot of uh, uh, big waves across the global financial system because uh, the very foundation of U.S. dollars was shaken. Um, so then, so then later on, so they changed this one to another one called petrodollars. So this one was due to is uh, is many um, established on oil. So basically, for example, in 1945, this one also at the end of the World War II, you can see the Saudi king and President Roosevelt. So they they met in the in the in the, battle, in the battleship. Um, so, you know, so they because uh, Saudi Arabia found a lot of oil, and so the United States wanted to have good relationship with Saudi Arabia at so that time. So in 1974, this was Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, and uh, in 1974, in June 1974, so after just a half a year later, after after Saudi Arabia uh, launched the embargo against the United States and Israel at that time, um, so they signed a very important treaty for air for, for both of them. So the United States guaranteed the safety and security of Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia made a promise that uh, when they sell oil. To other countries, they will accept and only accept U.S. dollars. So that's the foundation of petrodollars. So that's a substantial increase the demand for U.S. dollars. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, so basically then so every country, every oil exporting country also follows suit, and uh, that becomes a very uh, big core of the global financial system with petrodollars and with a lot of demand of uh, U.S. dollars. And, and the, so all countries find actually it's uh, really convenient to use every, to use U.S. dollars for everything. So this is uh, why U.S. dollar is so dominant in the global trade system. And um, but uh, currently we have uh, this uncertainty. If petrodollars are so important in the current global financial system, what if we don't use oil? So that's uh, 30 years later, for example, on carbon neutrality, we said as uh, oil demand will uh, decrease substantially. Then we don't need we don't need a lot of U.S. dollars to buy and sell oil. So then the demand for U.S. dollars will be weakened. And what kind of global financial system we are going to have at that time? So in next in the next thirty years, uh, sometime in the next thirty years, we will see a change. We will see that uh, something uh, something must be 
must be changed. And uh, and and uh, and this one is, uh, still has a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so what kind of things will happen under carbon neutrality, and uh, and also um, what kind of future systems we're going to run into? Um, so yeah, so if uh, if you look at this one, for example, if you if you see that uh, this is already a big a big thing that we don't have oil, if we don't use oil, then if you look at the Middle East, the Middle East economy is entirely relying on oil and, and natural gas, for example. So, you know, so a lot of wars have been fought in the Middle East. So what if we don't have oil? Well, what if we don't use oil in um, under carbon neutrality, in a carbon neutral world, for example, if that's the case, so they, how, you know, how, how can they cope with the economy? So if they don't receive enough money, um, so, it's, so that's permanent, so what kind of thing they can do? So it's whether the economy will collapse. So if that's, that's the case, and uh, Middle East will be un really unstable. So we're going to see a lot of changes there, and uh, that's uh, going to be a global change. Um, so, so that's, uh, so under carbon neutrality, this uh, thing may not uh, be always good, for example, in for these kind of cases, if their economic transition is not successful, if they cannot um, find some other economic sectors out of oil, and 30 years later, so they may run into very big troubles. And of course, everybody on this planet will see this change um, close to home as well. Not only, for example, is hydrogen. Hydrogen can also play a big role there. So hydrogen is also can be good, is liquefied. Hydrogen is also one of, one of the most important fuels. For example, we can use it for, uh, for, for running vehicles and uh, for running our energy economy, for example. So, so if you look at it, there's actually are some potential for the Middle East to produce hydrogen. So this one is just a this map showing that uh, how expensive it is to produce hydrogen. Um, so in the middle, it's basically you have desert, you have solar PV and a lot of solar PV and you can produce um, uh, hydrogen at a very low cost. And renewable, basically this one is uh, carbon free uh, almost. And so in the Middle East, for example, there are a lot of desert. So in the future, they may become uh, a hub of hydrogen production. So in that case, you know, so then they have to ship um, hydrogen liquefied hydrogen out instead of uh, oil and natural gas out so that's one of the things that uh, they're, they're, they're thinking about and uh, that's the potential um, economy that uh, could still play a role uh, 30 years later and as we so all of this uh, still face a lot of uncertainties we don't know what will happen 30 years from now okay so but uh, we know that uh, big things uh, will change so that's for sure so then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, electric sector, and then I'll talk about uh, these different fields. For example, if you see that this is our Castle Peak power station, it's a coal-based power station, you can see the uh, coal there. And so it's so under, under carbon neutrality, so these coal power stations will be in trouble. So, so if we if because the country coal emits about 40% of global emissions, um, so, yeah, so in future and on carbon neutrality a lot of this coal will be phased out. And in COP26, the most important target was on coal. Okay, so we want to try to phase out coal. So, but in 2050, for example, in Hong Kong's case, so this is, uh, this is CLP um, and also Hong Kong Electric also have coal power stations. And do they have to change? Okay, so it's recently in the past few years, in the past decade, you know, so Hong Kong has, um, has got into some plans. You know, so we want to reduce our emissions we want to achieve the 2035 goal of uh, emission reduction. So then we, we, we basically replaced uh, coal power stations. Uh, we are replacing the coal power stations with natural gas power stations. But you have to remember that uh, when after this transition, we are only going to reduce our emissions by half, okay, when you, when you switch from coal to natural gas. But carbon neutrality is a different story. Carbon neutrality means we have to get this one to almost zero. So, which means actually, if, uh, if you know, so, so then that's a very big dilemma for us because this new coal, natural gas power station is still new. Okay, they just got invested. And if we shut them down in one decade, for example, who are going to pay for it? Okay, so that's another thing that these uh, companies they must, they must face, they must think about it. And for Hong Kong's case, so, so country is, uh, we, ha we, haven't, we haven't been planning anything about it. So in, in, uh, in Chief Executive uh, Carol Lam's um, uh, policy address, you know, so she basically didn't mention much about 2035, how do you deal with uh, these natural gas power stations? Um, so, so if that's the case, if we have to phase them out, then we're in trouble. So, so we're gonna see that our, our electricity tariff will increase dramatically because eventually we have to pay. 
Okay, somebody has to pay for this. So, so then this one is, uh, do they have a future for natural gas power stations, for example? So especially for the new, for the newly built ones. So whether we should continue building natural gas power stations and uh, and then shut them down um, so very very quickly, or we have to really think in advance. So what kind of thing we really, what kind of infrastructure we really want in 2050 or 2060 on the carbon neutrality? So there's a lot of this um, facility, for example, in Hong Kong, we are building this one, the, the offshore liquefied natural gas terminal, is floating terminal. And it's, it's, it's also a very important infrastructure for us to ensure our supply, stable supply of natural gas. And also because we have to replace our coal power stations with natural gas power stations. So which means we're going to increase dramatically our consumption of natural gas in the past, in the next decade. But again, so if we don't have to use natural gas, then these pipelines, and cannot be used for other purposes. So who are gonna pay for this? So, so that's another thing that we have to really think carefully. Uh, otherwise, um, otherwise uh, this uh, kind of things will be, uh, will, be, will, be, will, be, will, be, will be troubling us in the future. So if we have to use uh, fossil fuels, as uh, Dr. Yu also mentioned, we can use one thing called CCS, carbon capture and storage. You can capture the carbon dioxide and store it on the ground. Or somewhere else, mostly underground in geological formations. Um, so we can use uh, some of it, but uh, but the scale is very different. We can use the so utilization product is uh, is uh, is good. It's it's very good uh, uh, perspective, but uh, the scale we're talking about is very different. So in the future, we have the storage. Basically, we will have to play very important roles if we still have to use the, uh, use uh, fossil fuels. And for example, in Hong Kong's case. If we if we have to use natural gas power stations, then we have to really think about uh, CCS. Otherwise, uh, we have to shut them down. Uh, in order to so let's assume that uh, Hong Kong really wants to achieve carbon neutrality. Okay, and uh, so we, after you capture the carbon dioxide, does not mean that the problem is over. Where are you going to put it? Store it. So we're talking again. So not just a few tons of carbon dioxide. We're talking about billions of tons per year. Okay, so you have to really store it for, for, for 30, for, for example, if you think that 30 years later, we're going to run into carbon neutrality, then we need a 30 year storage time. So, so to continue storing this much carbon dioxide on the ground. And if you, if you use uh, this uh, uh, fossil fuel power station for longer, then really the scale is massive. Then where are we going to store it? For example, this one is uh, basically the dark color, basically it's, uh, it's good places to sort, store carbon dioxide for example, in the Middle East, there's a possibility that they can serve us um, uh, for storing our carbon dioxide. So we can ship carbon dioxide to the Middle East, to those places where they have oil and gas fuels, and uh, this, uh, this uh, down there are good geological formations to help us um, store carbon dioxide. But in Southern China, for example, uh, so this place is not very good. And in Japan, the situation is even worse. Japan announced to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050, but Japan is so uh, in order for Japan to do this, it's actually very difficult uh, because they don't have enough renewables. Um, so, and uh, they don't have good places to store carbon dioxide and all those major storage sites are very far away from, 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 from the country. So that's also very big challenges. So it's for, for, the, for these countries, so, so they, in order to achieve carbon neutrality, the, the difficulty level uh, is much higher and which means also they have to spend so much more money uh, in this course, in order to really get it done, in order to fulfill their promises. Japan, for example, they can also rely on nuclear energy, but of course, you know, so this is uh, what happened in, 20, in 2011, very sad story. Um, so it's very big earthquake um, happened, then have Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station got into accidents, and this is, uh, this is what they're doing. So what is uh, a country happening in the, uh, in, the, in the plant? And so all of this uh, are just the water tanks. They have no choice. There's too much waste radiate, so the radiatively contaminated water stored in the in the factory, in the plant. Every day they got about 150 tons. Every day. It's accumulating every day. So, you know, so this is why they are so the previous prime minister announced they want to release it. So, you know, so this uh, the, the the streams, which means that they're going to be uh, affecting other countries as well. Yeah, so for example, nuclear energy is also getting it's also uh, having a lot of troubles, different countries have very different policies. Um, Japan basically is very difficult for them to revive it. 
um, Germany is going to shut them down. Um, so, but, but France, for example, is trying to build new ones. China is building a lot of new ones. Then, as a nuclear energy can help help us, but uh, it's, um, it's, it still has, has a lot of problems as well. So, and so in different countries, politics may not be able to um, help them that much. And for hydropower, hydropower basically, for example, this is Hoover Hoover Dam um, in Colorado River. Um, so it's a very massive dam. But as so it's uh, for, and for the entire world, basically we are running out of uh, a place to to have more hydropower. We do not have enough hydropower to run our system, but we do have enough wind and solar. So this is so for the future wind so, and solar. We have for, we have for a lot of things uh, that can, they can contribute. So they are so we are, we are hoping that they can help us uh, really phase out fossil fuels and uh, and uh, really get into and transition towards renewables. And also, most important thing about wind and solar is their resource base. I would say that hydropower could be good, but they have their own troubles. And uh, one of the biggest troubles for hydropower is also because they do, we do just do not have enough hydropower to run the entire economy. But we do have enough wind and solar power to run the global economy. So about almost every place. So, anyway, so for example, for this one, you know, so we have um, so different places. So we have, of course, the wind and, and solar resources. Are different so this is um, a solar but uh, across across uh, almost every country we do the calculations so we have sufficient uh, amount of renewables to especially wind and solar to run the entire economy so that's the thing that we can envision um, this kind of um, sectors for example if you are working on fossil fuel sectors then really have to think about uh, you know whether whether you know your job is stable or not but if you are if you're working in renewable energy sector, so even though country they're already big, but they have even brighter future, because uh, because uh, the energy transition uh, under carbon neutrality is going to be uh, even faster, and uh, we have we need fundamental transition. But uh, renewables have their own problems. Um, so this one is the solar radiation. So this one shows you direct solar radiation, and this one is a diffuse solar radiation. If you look at it, for example, solar radiation mainly happens during daytime, of course, when you have when we have sun, and uh, but uh, at night we have problems, right? And also, for example, before sunset, this sharp drop of solar energy gives um, a lot, gives us a lot of trouble uh, to our electric system. So, so this one, if we cannot tackle this sharp drop before sunset, our electric system could collapse. Okay, so that's another very big challenge, and also we have to tackle the time when we don't do not have solar energy. So, and also this a lot of this wind and solar energy resources is very far away. So, which means we need a bit, we need transmission lines, and because these transmission lines are super expensive, this ultra high voltage transmission lines are super expensive. And uh, and uh, for example, for for the solar, you think that is if all of these transmission lines are left vacant during night. So actually, then this one to transmit the electricity from far away places, for example, to Hong Kong would be super expensive. And are we willing to pay this high price for transmission? That's another thing that we have to consider. And also, for example, for this one, you can see that, that the energy economic geography will change because we said this through the map. And for example, uh, most of the Chinese uh, uh, wind and solar actually located to the western part of the country because that's where you have desert. Okay, and all these places, but most people actually live into the east and uh, country. All the power stations are actually in the in the eastern part of the country, but in the future uh, things could change. So it's a lot of things, which means uh, the, the western part of China. So country the desert is barren land. There's no value, but in the future that could be very valuable. But so one of the things, for example, Japan is uh, they don't have desert. So that's another thing that um, uh, is going to give them into troubles. Then as for renewables, if we really want to use renewables, another very important sector we have to really look into is the energy storage. So, you know, so this is Guangzhou pump storage hydro. And so this kind of, we need more of this energy storage. And also another one um, recently is also very important, lithium iron battery. In the, past, in the past decade, you can see that battery pack price has dropped by almost uh, one order magnitude. So example, CATL, um, if you buy stocks and you know that uh, CATL is, uh, it's a star in Chinese uh, stock market. Um, it's, 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 it's a stock price uh, uh, increased by almost one order magnitude in two or three years. So, yeah, so one of the things because they produce uh, the largest producer of lithium iron battery in the world. Um, so, yeah, so, it's, so that's the thing. So they have the they have the, the thing. So we, when we see this uh, this energy carbon neutrality and this kind of changes, 
And we see that some will win, some will lose. And final slide. So if we see that, for example, so 1990, if you compare 1990 to 2020, the world has been so different. 1990 was still in the Cold War. So we still have uh, there are two superpowers of the Union and the United States competing with each other. And China's economy was uh, very tiny. Okay, but 2020 is entirely different. Now we are talking about 2050 on the carbon neutrality. We are facing, so we are facing another dramatic uh, pathway in the next three, de three decades. So what kind of world we are running into? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a very big question facing quite a lot of different countries, quite a lot of different uh, sectors, and also for us as well, because our jobs, for example, could be really affected if you're working or in a sector that is uh, doomed and really have to think about it. And also before you jump into these different sectors, you really have to think about whether this sector uh, could, could really have a role uh, on carbon neutrality. I'll stop here, thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Xu, very, very much again for a very detailed uh, sort of disposition of the many challenges and but also opportunities for achieving carbon neutrality from mostly the energy and transportation sectors, but also related to other uh, sectors as well. So thank you very much again. So I guess this is a really good time for all of us to uh, come together and uh, and if the audience have any questions uh, or anything that you would like to comment on, uh, either you know the uh, very uh, the optimism actually shared by both speakers, uh, but all but perhaps maybe a little bit of a pessimism uh, facing such kind of uh, challenges, uh, feel absolutely free to have this room for discussion and uh, maybe some questions for the speakers as well. 咁呢一度可以係大家用任何個 language 都得嘅，係啊任何嘅語言，因為啊 Professor Xu 咧誒都係會誒聽得明廣東話嘅，咁 of course William 都係啦，啊又或者係普通話都 OK 㗎，我相信兩位都係啊英文、普通話、廣東話都 OK 嘅呢一個啊 forum 裏邊係啦，咁啊喺呢度，不如咧我見到就其實有誒、呃、有有已經有啲嘅 question， 咁不如可能 answer 咗佢哋先，咁我見到啊啊 Maisie Tan 咧。Uh, so Meiji Tan has actually asked uh, uh, two questions already. So I guess uh, the first one, and actually both are very uh, related. So the first one is uh, Dr. Yu or maybe Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Shi as well. Do you foresee Hong Kong actually leading green finance in the future, given that it is the financial hub in the world? global financial hub, but then uh, are we actually leading it right now? Do you, do you think, see any potential for that? Yeah, maybe I start first. Um, um, I, I'm frankly, I'm not a, an expert, a leading expert in this area to answer this. I, I think the Hong Kong government or the, or the financial experts will answer, but I um. But you you will see uh, we need uh, we are looking at all these uh, green financial instrument uh, to help facilitate uh, you know the I would say say the paradigm shift to divert all this capital flow to uh, more sustainable projects. Okay, we we can play a role like this, and and um but but still a, a long road we we need training we need to engage all these corporations in the in the past i, I can share some uh, uh first hand experience uh i i asked some big corporations to to go for green bonds okay now we have only a uh, very big conglomerate they need to demonstrate you know uh, then they they have issued some some kinds of green bonds but still uh, not not to mention the SME issue because of the cost, uh, but I think um, for those big companies, they 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 respond. Okay, I I can easily uh, do the financing to get all these money loans, you know, from the market, from the financial institution. Why I bother to go through all these green bond procedures? You know, the use of proceeds. The fund you need a uh, kind of monitoring, reporting, and then you need to meet some KPI, the social KPI or environmental KPI, uh, when using all this fund to achieve a kind of sustainability objectives. So they they don't bother at the very beginning. Okay, so um, 
and also the incentive, whether a uh, a uh, uh, few one uh, percent or less than one percent, uh, lower, you know, in the interest rate as a kind of big motivation. So I I think um we our bank now has a target, you know, to pursue in terms of green bonds, green loans. They they need to find customers. Uh, I I think that's that's a good trend, and. Uh, that's one part for the green financial instrument. Uh, for the another part is about carbon trading. As we continue to mention about the, carb the mitigation, the carbon reduction, but another aspect is carbon offset. Um, what kind of credit we can generate or we can buy or we can sell, you know, uh, throughout the platform. And also Hong Kong, the, the role of Hong Kong to pay a certification, a standard, kind of certifier. So all these uh, must be in place, you know, to facilitate all this uh, carbon trading, carbon asset management, and also, you know, um, kind of financial uh, financing. So Hong Kong, uh, as I said before, policy, uh, technology, and finance, they, they are all very important. How we can work together to make things happen. Um, I, can, I can just chip yeah. in a few, a few cents and ask, yes. so we do see that Hong Kong has um, great potential in this. Um, so green finance is very important for the development of new technologies. We need uh, the first development of these technologies. And also so we need more, more companies and more startups. Um, so Hong Kong can really play a role there. But, uh, but of course, you know, so different financial centers, they all see this. It's going to be big, big business and the big service sectors we're competing. And uh, of course, you know, so in our competition, nobody will, will say for sure that uh, who will win in, you know, in future. But uh, indeed, the, the, the pie is big, the competition is fierce, and hopefully uh, Hong Kong can catch a big piece of the pie. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, so uh, let me see, uh, there's another question. Uh, do Hong Kong have enough space to build enough solar and wind to meet its energy demand if it does not use gas as a transition fuel? Yeah, I think both of you uh, have uh, mentioned quite a bit about it. So uh, perhaps you can. No, Hong Kong does not have enough uh, place um, to really store enough uh, solar PV and, uh, and wind turbine because not only about capacity. Um, so when you use uh, solar and PV and, uh, and, and wind turbines, and so the capacity factor, which means you cannot use that for many hours. Um, during the year. Um, so, it's, uh, for example, if we, we have uh, at peak time, we have about uh, uh, 10 gigawatt of uh, peak load, for example, in Hong Kong. So, if we really want to have a, a solar PV and, uh, and wind turbines, we need really have a lot more than this. And we need storage. But the problem in Hong Kong is we do not have enough resources and do not have enough space to do this. In future, um, almost for sure that we have to uh, really import those um, uh, renewable electricity. This is why that um, uh, this transmission or this energy storage is going to play very major roles in, the f in, in future Hong Kong's energy, uh, energy transition or carbon neutrality. Without this, it's just not possible to, do, to, to really achieve carbon neutrality because the scale, again, it's not, it's not a we, have, we install a few, a few solar PV panels on a rooftop and we still want to win turbines. It's, it's the scale that we're talking about, the scale of, uh, on the carbon neutrality is just so massive. Um, it's not possible unless, for example, if, even if we want to destroy all of our country parks uh, to plant with to plant uh, wind turbines there, and uh, and so it's not enough. Still not enough. Right. So, William, do you have any input in this? Yeah, but I believe uh, Professor Xu has uh, made a very very uh, insightful point already about the inefficiency of uh, having a city alone uh, to achieve uh, carbon neutrality without. Uh, regional collaboration. Um, so about related to that, where is Hong Kong right now? So do you consider we ever started yet? And what do you think is the first thing the government should focus on? Like, yeah, so I, I guess this is a, the question that I also have and many people also have. If the government, uh, let's say the government is leading the road to uh, carbon neutrality, what should it really focus more first and foremost uh, in Hong Kong? Uh, maybe let, let me start first. Um, uh, that, that can also answer another question about um, our utility. I, I think uh, what you can see, uh, 2050, uh, the, this, 
the roadmap for carbon neutrality. I, I think they they try to lay all the burden onto uh, the utilities. You know, it's easy, right? You don't need to bother to engage everyone to to change their lifestyle, you know, all this. Although they mentioned, I have to admit, but it's a very challenging. We keep talking about carbon reduction for many years, but we got a record high emission every year, okay? So behavioral change, you know, all these NGOs are useless. You know, they keep talking about, okay, lifestyle, lifestyle, come on. Um, but, but, we, but I think we, we will start to be serious now, from now on. And so you will see it's more of a supply side man. They try to decarbonize the energy source, which accounts for almost 70% of carbon emissions in Hong Kong. So if you can fix these two utilities, okay, they have a decarbonized carbon neutral energy, okay, get done, okay. But how about demand side management? We have responsibility, you and me and corporations, you know, uh, for some other countries, they even set target for the corporations, top 1,000, you know, high, highest uh, emitter, you know, in the city. Or oh, I mentioned the donut model. It's really adopted by the uh, Norwegian country. Okay, so one, uh, at least they, they start. So I, I think uh, we, we do hope our energy source is carbon neutral, but but that's the, that doesn't mean we don't need to bear the responsibility to cut our emissions ourselves, our corporate. You know, I, I think that's the area we, we need to think further. Yeah, for that one, so it's, uh, it's, uh, I mentioned a little bit about it, for example, is so Hong Kong is replacing coal power stations because these coal power stations have reached their design lifetime, 30 years. So we're replacing it with, uh, with natural, gas power, natural gas power stations. And so we are building these new, new natural gas power stations. But the problem is uh, this new natural gas power station will keep emitting carbon dioxide, even though that, that emission has already been reduced by half. So that's actually a, a very big trouble for us because uh, for coal power stations, if they're old, we can build new ones. But for if, what if new power stations? New power stations, for example, this is what Hong Kong's uh, planning. So it's, we should not only think about uh, getting some emission reduction, we really have to think on the carbon neutrality. So when we plan things, plan this infrastructure, so these infrastructures will be still in use. They, will, they should be in use for a few decades. And otherwise, uh, somebody has to pay. And eventually, of course, we have to pay in Hong Kong. Um, so in this case, you know, we, we really hope that Hong Kong could be more proactive to really think not just in the next 10 years, but also in the next uh, 30 years, and you know, what country we should do. And uh, but uh, the policy address uh, has not really fully addressed these kind of things. Um, one one uh, area, I, I, one point I want to add is um, about the adaptation measures. We never mention about adaptation. We actually don't know what kind of climatic impact we are going to face. Um, so that's an area. I know mitigation is important, but. You cannot avoid disaster, frankly speaking. That's the mindset uh, global agreed uh, go with global consensus. We prepare for the future disasters. All right. So um, I guess we can only entertain perhaps a few, uh, just maybe one or two more questions for the interest of time. And uh, I guess uh, one of the uh, I think I would lump um, two questions together. So one of it, which is like uh, very interestingly on the climate change performance index of 2022, uh, India is shown with green on par with Denmark. Uh, just wondering what uh, India have done uh, so far. And uh, indeed, uh, as far as I've known, a lot of the, for instance, uh, CLP and uh, 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 in Hong Kong uh, have like a carbon offset program uh, that actually uh, is related to projects in India as well. So uh, being one of the uh, most rapidly rising uh, e uh, economies in the world, uh, how is India? I mean, if you have any uh, special uh, notice on this uh, for the country. Uh, and also many discussion over 30 years from uh, Kyoto Protocol to COP20. Um, is there, uh, how do you discuss the, uh, those 
let me see. So yeah, this, this is kind of related. And uh, do European countries have uh, taken the lead and go ahead with uh, many others? Yeah, and uh, I, this is my question as well. How do you see the developing countries uh, are actually, um, how, 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 what are the roles in really leading this whole uh, carbon neutrality role, roadmap? Oh, okay, let me respond to the India one first. And then uh, I, I only, uh, I, I, I uh, trying to archive the report uh, India uh, ran number 10, uh, very high, very good. Um, India's, uh, the, some of the comments, India joined Brazil, Indonesia, and Turkey as the only G20 countries rating high in renewable energy category. As mentioned, uh, like CLP, they, they invest some, although that percentage is not uh, very significant, I mean, in terms of the entire, but, but definitely, uh, and uh, renewable energy, uh, has score, you know, uh, uh, you know, to to help the 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 ranking, and uh, yeah, I I, I think uh, yes, yeah, that's the area, yeah, they they perform very well. <laughs> yeah, for the India part is so it's, I, I don't know how they rank there, but so one of the things, of course, the emission per per capita emissions is still very low. Um, it's only about uh, one fifth of China's per capita emissions, because China's per capita emission is at European level. Okay, it's the same, but it's going a little bit higher nowadays. And India actually, so they are also quite successful in, in, in installing solar PV. The solar, solar energy installation has also skyrocketed in the past decade. That's there, but they also have their troubles. So, um, their coal is, so, their dom so their energy system is also dominated by coal. Um, so that's uh, something that they have to have to worry about uh, in the future if they really want to have uh, this uh, very rapid economic growth and what kind of energy system will support this additional economic activities. So, so, it's, so then, and, but of course, another one is uh, their geographical space there. Um, so India, is in terms of uh, countries' size, in terms of areas, only one third of China's, but they have the same population. India is going to be, become the largest populated country in just a matter of few years. Um, so as in this uh, system, if they are also going to have the same economy, and so they also need quite substantial amount of um, uh, space for for this uh, solar PV and, and wind. And uh, do they have the space? Um, do they have uh, all of these uh, uh, resources to meet the dem future demand? That's a very big challenge for them. And energy uh, transition or carbon neutrality is a very big challenge. It's, uh, it's, it's going to give every country, especially major countries, all headaches. Right, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the, I, I really uh, like this question uh, and the fi very final question by actually our colleague. Um, so uh, electric vehicles may seem very clean to operate, but the production and dis uh, deposition, uh, disposition of uh, lithium batteries may be quite polluting, right? And, and this is a con uh, question that uh, many people uh, have asked before. Yeah, how, how good are we doing in terms of waste disposal? Uh, and that's the same thing for uh, solar panels as well, right? Like the solar panel, uh, there can also be a disposal problem. Uh, so how are we dealing with that in terms of, uh, you know, not uh, compromising one environmental problem with another? Um, maybe maybe I, I try to answer uh, a bit. Um, uh, if you can solve the problem, I mean the battery, I think you will get rich. Like the uh, Bedrock CEO uh, mentioned, the future unicorn will be all these, um, you know, um, low carbon tech kind of unicorn. So uh, that's a big problem, Fanny. But but you know, uh, the entire world now try to face out the traditional vehicle. So uh, that that's an area we we really look, uh, need to look into, and about the certification, um, you you know like Tesla, they they produce the the uh, electrical vehicle and earn the carbon credit, okay, uh, compared to traditional one. So they generate carbon credit and sell it to the corporations. They make a loss in uh, vehicle manufacturing, but they earn money. Uh, 1.6 billion US uh, from selling carbon credit. So um, one question asked about all these ways uh, 
reduction and whether that can generate carbon credit. First, whether there's the calculation, the protocol came up. In China, you have all this EV vehicle uh, kind of protocol, how to do the calculation uh, or the train, you know, all this. So you form, follow the formula. And I heard, uh, I talked to one uh, listed company earlier. They are helping to do the incinerator, the waste, burning the waste, and then uh, to, to calculate the, the, the carbon credit they can earn. So you need to go through a rigorous uh, certification process. In China, they call CCER, okay, China CER, certified uh, kind of uh, carbon credit. Uh, but in overseas, they mainly follow the clean development mechanism, CDM, the Europe standard. Then they, they, they can sell a higher price, definitely 50 euro compared to 50 uh, RMB, okay? Um, that's one area you, you need to look into. And, and more importantly is the additionality, the concept of additionality. Uh, don't create something, you, your input is much higher in carbon than the output, you get all this thing out, even not saving the carbon emission. Okay, so um, that I hope I can answer part of the questions. Okay, thank you. For that part, I also can chip in a little bit. So indeed, so it's, we really have to take the life cycle on, on perspective when we look at uh, different issues. So it's indeed, so we don't want to um, solve one problem, but the solution is more dangerous. It happened before, okay? So it's, for example, if you think about um, our ozone problems, the ozone depletion problems in ozone layer, we had something great, but you eventually found uh, the, the good thing that we thought it was very good, perfect uh, substance, and it turns out to be very bad. Um, so indeed, for this one, we really have to pay attention to do this one. And uh, of course, the problem has already become uh, more visible than before. But there's another thing that we also have to look into this. For example, for this kind of batteries, for example, in the future, if we don't use much oil, when we have a lot of electric vehicles, let's say, then we're going to use all kinds of metals, all, all kinds of uh, minerals to produce these um, things uh, for carbon, neut carbon neutrality. For example, if so then the distribution, the global distribution of these metals, these minerals is very different from the distribution of oil. For example, the future geopolitics of energy, for example, will not be determined by oil and gas. For the Middle East, it was, uh, we, we have diminished the importance here. But Peru, for example, these countries, when they have a lot of these kind of minerals, uh, lithium, let's say, um, for example, so it's Afghanistan has a lot of lithium. So this is uh, one of the reasons why Af Afghanistan really can play some roles here. So in the future, of course, when you have this, uh, this kind of troubles, and, uh, and so they have to really look into all kinds of uh, resources to get these minerals, get this metal. And one of these uh, uh, solutions, one of the resources that we can get minerals is the, from the waste batteries. Because you can, you can recycle, you can get these minerals, these metals, and reuse it. Um, so it's in the future, and so it's when, because now we have the demand there, and uh, and so we, as we said, we we need further development of new technologies. But with this, with this demand, with uh, this one, there's a good possibility that uh, we we will tackle this one. But of course, we'll still have a lot of uncertainties and how this one can be tackled, and hopefully, we can also minimize uh, the potential negative impacts of these new solutions to our carbon problem. But th thank you very much. I, there's like a related question uh, related to waste that I have missed earlier. Uh, so someone from uh, a friend from uh, uh, Indonesia actually have this problem, uh, a question. Uh, if a recycling of uh, e-waste can actually reduce carbon emission, can it act be actually be counted as a carbon offset? Uh, yeah, I, I answered yes. Uh, whether protocol, you know, to do all this certification and, and to measure, you know, the input output. Uh, so yeah, you need to go through this process. And after certification, uh, the standard uh, by based on the standard calculation, the protocol, then uh, you can try to apply uh, for the carbon credit. Yeah, but if you say, okay, I say something uh, from, we think from doing something, uh, it depends on the additionality concept. So that's a, another aspect you need to consider. So another thing, for example, on this is uh, Europe, European Union is, have, is having this very big policies, the, the carbon border adjustment tax. 
it's going to affect a lot of countries. Um, so, so if, if you have uh, this kind of uh, new technologies, for example, for different companies, if, they, if they're running their life cycle analysis of their emissions, if you have uh, this kind of thing that can reduce their life cycle emissions, um, so, yeah, so that can uh, give them better advantage in, uh, in accessing this new uh, markets. So in the future, for example, we are expecting that if, uh, if these major guys um, really get into the border adjustment tax, and uh, so it's for the, in terms of global trade, um, so we're going to have uh, also major impacts on what kind of products we're going to produce and how we can reduce the life cycle emissions of different products. Otherwise, uh, you're going to lose all the markets. So, well, I guess uh, in, the, in the interest of time, uh, well, I have to kind of end here. Uh, the discussion has been vibrant and uh, both of you have, I've learned a lot from both of you. Uh, this is an aspect. Uh, these are aspects that uh, I as a climate scientist have often missed, you know, like uh, we tell you, the, okay, the, all of those projections, but what are we going to do about it? And thank you both very much today for your wonderful insights. And uh, I'm sure um, both uh, uh, prof uh, Professor Xu and uh, Dr. Yu, uh, their contact can be uh, kind of find, uh, found online. And so if you have any further questions that you would like to uh, follow up with them, I'm sure they would uh, welcome uh, you to contact them uh, using contacts that they have available uh, on the public domain. And uh, so uh, with, uh, fi so finally, uh, let's, uh, well, uh, thank both of you again, Professor Xu and uh, Dr. Yu uh, for your wonderful uh, participation today. All right, thank you.